Uh, well, it's part of the culture of the company is always to look at um, is there a better way of doing something? Um, can we uh, can we try something different that that improves this or makes the workflow better for people? So we don't um, we don't shy away from challenges. In fact, our the projects that are the, the most fun end up being the most rewarding are the ones that at the beginning you look at and you're not entirely sure how you're going to do it. Uh, that's where the real excitement is. Yeah, that's it's probably it's working with the client. It's kind of understanding what their comfort level is um, with trying something new and different. Um, the, what level of innovation is required on a show is, is a lot, just completely story dependent. Um, um, as I say, some of my favorite projects are the ones where you're reading through the script and you aren't entirely sure how something's going to be done. And the innovation that comes out of trying to meet that challenge is uh, some of the most rewarding things that we do and where some of the best innovations come from. You know, there's certainly a class of innovation that comes from uh, deliberate planning where we're we have worked on a particular bit of tech on one show and we see application on another, so we're going to keep working on that to try and improve things. But um, um, one of the more exciting bits of tech are the ones that are completely unplanned, that are just purely in response to a line that we read in the script. There's a lot of informa information sharing that happens at the company. Um, in particular, uh, we do a thing called CG Weeklies where uh, a after a show is wrapped, the interesting and unique aspects of that show from a technique or technological standpoint are presented to the whole company. So it's a chance for you to see what they did on Warcraft if you didn't work on Warcraft or, or what's happened on this other show. So uh, yeah, we, we do try and uh, spread all that info so everybody's aware of what tech's been developed. And that's important because you can often get siloed on a show where you're working very hard on a show and there's some really amazing thing happening over on the other side of the company, but I'm just working on this. And um, so we try and fix that by this uh, periodic information sharing. But part of the culture of the company is, is one of very open information sharing and helping people out with things. So uh, it does happen naturally because it's a culture that we've fostered there since the beginning. How does the uh, well, it's a variety of factors. Um, you know, one you have to choose from what's being made, right? So uh, we have to look and see what projects are, are on the horizon and start talking to the filmmakers about those. Um, there, to, to some extent, the, you know, because of the size of the company, we have to keep booking a certain amount of work to stay the company that we are. So we're looking uh, for things that, number one, we're looking to work with the best filmmakers. Uh, we're looking for projects that uh, can create striking and memorable imagery. Uh, and then the last one is we also have to feed the machine. So it's trying to satisfy all those requirements, you know, get enough work to keep the, the people busy, to uh, drive enough revenue that supports the R&D staff that we uh, we have. Um, so it's trying to balance all those factors. One for the real, one for the meal. Right? Well, I, I'd say I don't think that there's anything that, that we do that doesn't have some kind of merit to it uh, artistically, but uh, you, you have to you have to find the right balance of. Uh, of um, this is this is one that uh, that will keep a lot of people em employed, and, and this is one that's uh, there may not be a lot of uh, profit in this one, but it's really good for us creatively. Uh, first jobs I did, I was a model maker, so I built built miniatures, and uh, did that for. Uh, probably five five years or so before uh, I was gradually making a transition into, into camera work, and I got hired at ILM as a motion control camera assistant. Uh, yeah, well, I, I feel very privileged to uh, have been invited into 
it's sort of become a second family for me. You know, that uh, George Lucas, um, back in the, the late 70s, sort of single-handedly created this sort of wonderful filmmaking community in Northern California. And you know, I'm privileged that I got invited to, to join into that family. And they're just really wonderful people, and I love the atmosphere there. And as soon as I started I, at the company, I felt like well, I found my people. This is, this is fantastic. Um, and it's not hard to stay at a company where you feel like, uh, like you really belong and you really like all the people that you work with. So it's, boy, time flies. Well, I came up. Yeah, I came up through the ranks. I was a, a technical assistant first, then a camera assistant, and then a camera operator, and then I was worked in computer graphics as a uh, kind of as a technical director, and then as a associate visual effects supervisor, and then finally to visual effects supervisor. Um, and you know, the, the ILM's a meritocracy. What happens is uh, is people that um, I perform well on the, the projects that impress the, the folks that they're working for. Sort of get more responsibility on upcoming projects. So, you know, the trajectory that you take through the company is kind of really related on um, on the uh, the talent um, and uh, and how well you execute and work with uh, other people. I don't know. I I did camera for for a good long time, and I've enjoyed that quite a lot. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm an amateur photographer, so I still do work with cameras. Something I'm very excited about is uh, uh, some of the technological advances of a lot of the filmmaking tools that we're, we're working on. Um, we, we've had a high dynamic range pipeline at ILM for some time now. We always kind of work on this broader dynamic range, even if the exhibition is less. And something that's been happening recently is high dynamic range exhibition, both theatrical exhibition and home video exhibition. And I'm very excited about that. I love it. I think it's, it's very visually pleasing. Um, so we sort of talking about uh, high dynamic range um, in relation to Rogue One from the very beginning. Um, we did have a theatrical high dynamic range release. There still aren't a lot of theaters that exhibit it, but uh, um, as we were in the final weeks of the show, uh, I made a pitch for, I want to try and make a, a high dynamic range home video release of this, the best version of that that we can make it. So uh, I did get uh, an opportunity to um, have a small crew to uh, recomposite some shots and fix some things. You know, as you're looking at shots on a broader dynamic range canvas, you inevitably want to make some uh, changes to rebalance this versus that. And I'm super pleased with how that turned out. Uh, the uh, home video color timing, uh, the high, high dynamic range home video color timing, I think is a spectacularly good looking version of the movie. In fact, it might be the best looking version of the movie.